Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. This past Saturday, President Joe Biden signed into law the first major federal gun safety legislation passed in decades, marking a significant bipartisan breakthrough on one of the most contentious policy issues in Washington. The legislation, which came together in the aftermath of recent mass shootings in Uvalde, Texas, and Buffalo, New York, includes new funding to help states implement and run crisis intervention programs, manage red flag laws, and limit gun access for those convicted of domestic violence. But despite the policy breakthrough, Americans remain bitterly divided on guns. Many on the left are horrified by the level of gun violence in the United States, which far surpasses the rates in other developed countries with stricter gun laws. They see the crisis as a true public health emergency. Many conservatives see the right to bear arms as sacrosanct and a key part of American identity. They're very wary of any efforts to limit their access to guns. Is it possible to bridge this divide on the level of shared values? What can we learn from one another's lived experiences that influence our thoughts and feelings about deadly weapons? What are the trade-offs between gun rights and public health, and how do we navigate them as fellow Americans? My guests on this episode were Mark Beckwith, the former bishop of Newark, New Jersey, and a longtime gun safety activist, and Wilk Wilkerson, a working-class conservative from Minnesota and a strong proponent of gun rights. Mark and Wilk don't see eye to eye, but they do see each other's hearts. And I believe this podcast is a testament to what's possible when we speak fully, freely, and without fear, with charity for all and malice toward none. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and as always, our email is media at braverangels.org. Mark and Wilk, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Kieran. It's nice to be here and to engage in Braver Angels and the important work that we do. Yeah, thank you, Kieran. I'm, I'm uh, honored to be here. Thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. It is my pleasure. Wilk, I want to start with you. Tell us about your first experience with a gun. Man, I, I, I'll tell you what, I'm, I was too young to even remember my uh my first experience with a gun to be honest with you uh from the day i was born there was a gun in my household if not multiple guns in my household um you know i i was uh i was trained to use guns as a very very young uh young person started hunting with my dad as soon as i was able to uh as soon as i was able to go i mean literally i i bet i was in diapers the first time i ever went hunting with my dad so um been around guns my whole entire life um i know the first time i i shot a shotgun i was too small to even hold the gun up to my shoulder so i had it uh had my dad holding me you know around the waist and holding the gun and uh or holding the uh butt of the shotgun underneath my arm and uh and yeah that's that's really how it started i've been around guns my whole entire life and how was the issue of gun safety treated in your home given that it sounds like your dad had a fair amount of experience with handling weapons. Oh yeah, it was always safety first. I mean, safety first was absolutely the uh, the um, bedrock of anything having to do with firearms in my home. Uh, and, and, and you know, just like me, my father and and his father before him, they they all had had guns in the home their their whole entire lives. So. Um, yeah, it was, uh, never touch a gun without an adult present. Um, always uh, the, the very first rule was always, it does not matter if you watch somebody check that gun, uh, to make sure that gun was clear of ammunition. Uh, the first thing that you do anytime you touch a gun is to, uh, check it, make sure it's unloaded. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was an absolute every single time. And then, uh, yeah, treat every gun as if it is loaded, even though you know it's unloaded. So never point that gun at anything that you don't wish to kill or destroy. Um, that is that that really was the deal. I mean, there was a very very strong and un uh, unwavering set of rules when it came to firearms in our home. And these days, do you 
go hunting often, go to the gun range. What's your relationship now with guns? All of the above. Yeah. I mean, I hunt, uh, you know, hunt multiple times a year. I've got multiple guns. I've got, uh, um, a firing range. I've, I've got a shooting range on my property. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, we hunt uh, multiple times a year for different, you know, whether, you know, different kinds of game, uh, plus we shoot for sport here on our property. And so, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a way of life. It's part of our life. And as you've gotten older and your own politics have evolved, how would you say guns relate to your politics and the issue of gun rights and gun control and gun safety? Uh, with regard to my politics, I mean, I, uh, I, I know, you know, being an issues voter, uh, one of the primary issues when it comes to politics and politicians is um, those who would attempt to strip me of my God-given right to protect myself and my family would not be somebody that I'd be interested in voting for. Hmm. Well, I'll come back to some of the political questions, but Mark, I want to turn things over to you and... I guess, first same question, what was your first interaction or experience with a gun? Uh, I think in the neighborhood that I grew up in, uh, north of Chicago, a couple kids had BB guns. Uh, I remember on a family vacation uh, in northern Wisconsin, uh, we shot uh, I think a 22 at, at tin cans across a valley, very safe. And then I was a Boy Scout, and I think um, I had a couple couple uh, uh, times at a at a firing range and maybe have sh shot skeet. But I really don't have relationship much with a gun, and and I think that's a lot of the fault line because as Wilk is uh, saying, he, he's had a lifelong uh, relationship with guns, and so many people. Uh, who are advocating for more gun safety do not have relationships with guns. And so they project all sorts of uh, opinions and attitudes and uh, notions on, on people who do have guns. And I think one of the things that we need to do is to understand one each other uh, a little bit better. So you mentioned the issue of gun safety advocacy. And I know, Mark, you've been an activist for gun safety. Can you talk a little bit about that evolution as you be, were a young man and grew up? How did your relationship to that activism evolve and how has it changed through Braver Angels and through your interactions with people on the other side of the divide? Sure. Uh, in college, uh, I uh, was very much engaged and formed by the anti-Vietnam War movement, and uh, and through that, and through my my spiritual journey, um, became committed to nonviolence, and so that's been a hallmark of my ministry and my life uh, ever since I was 19, 20 years old. And what really sort of moved it to a different dimension was after the Newtown, Connecticut shooting in 2012, uh, when 26 kids were killed. And uh, I called a bunch of my colleague bishops. And uh, actually before that, a couple of bishops set, called me and said, can we do something about gun violence? And we were just starting that then uh, to, to organize around that. When in Newtown, Connecticut happened, uh, so many other of my colleagues from all across the country said, we need to offer our voice, our witness, uh, to reduce the scourge of gun violence and, and, and uh, engage in activities uh, and, and ideas that promote gun safety. And what are the ways in which you think we as a society can reduce gun violence, given the Second Amendment, given the individualism that's core to American identity, and frankly, given how many guns are already out there, and I don't just mean policy, although I'd be curious to hear your thoughts there, but as a society and as a culture, how can we reduce the staggering 
levels of gun violence that we have in the United States, particularly when compared to almost every other country? Sure. Well, I think uh, several things. One is what I've learned as I continue to uh, engage in gun violence prevention work is uh, it's important to do what we're doing now is to bring people who have different opinions on it together and to listen to one another and see if there's a common ground that could be discovered. Several years ago, I went to a gun show in Massachusetts and what I discovered there uh, among the attendees uh, is that they talked a language that I didn't understand. It wasn't that it wasn't English, but they were talking about uh, uh, experiences and equipment that was unfamiliar to me. And I thought, oh, this is profoundly American. Uh, guns are a manifestation of it, but this is profoundly American. It goes back to our, our origins. And what I sense is, and I heard a little bit of that from, from Wilk, but I hear it more from others, uh, there's this sense that we on the gun violence prevention side want to take that part of the culture away, want to erase it, make it disappear. And we can't do that. So we need to be engaged in conversations to listen to one another. Uh, the other thing that I think how to reduce uh, gun violence is for the past 40 years or so, this has been framed as a second amendment issue. And I see it as a public health issue. And so I was trained maybe 15 years ago to stop using the term gun control because as soon as you use the word gun control, the term gun control, it immediately ends up being a, an argument or discussion about the second amendment. And it gets very difficult to move things forward. But if we can talk about gun safety and gun users that I know, uh, and Wilk has said this just now, are uh, passionate about uh, gun safety. I remember talking to a gun owner, a hunter, uh, who told me a friend of his uh, that he would go hunting with, he decided, I'm not gonna go hunting with you any, anymore because you won't unload your firearm when you cross over a fence. Uh, so safety, I think, is a, is a key ingredient. And what generated the Second Amendment uh, framework and what has been the focus really goes back to the 1960s. And the Second Amendment uh, passion wasn't introduced by the NRA, but was instead introduced by the Black Panthers. This is cited in a book by Jill Lepore, who teaches at Harvard, uh, called These Truths. And in the 1960s, the Black Panthers say, we said, we need to exercise our Second Amendment rights to protect ourselves from the oppression that we continue to experience. Well, the NRA heard that and shifted its focus from sportsmanship, safety, uh, target shooting, um, teaching children the ins and outs of, of firearm uh, uh, marksmanship to uh, the Second Amendment. And it's been passionate and vehement about the Second Amendment ever since. And that has framed the conversation uh, in my experience. And I'm hoping and do whatever I can to reframe the conversation from Second Amendment to public health. Mm. Wilk, beyond the practice of gun safety in terms of safely and responsibly handling weapons, how do you think we as a society can start to reduce the level of gun violence without infringing on what you see as your God-given right to protect yourself and your family? Well, I think Mark makes a great point when he talks about it being a public health issue. I just don't, I, I, I see it a bit differently then Mark, in the sense that the public health issue that leads a lot to, uh, to a lot of the gun violence is actually the mental health aspect of it. Um, so while guns are used in a lot of violent crime in our country, the vast majority of that is either people with mental health issues or basically urban gang violence. Okay, the urban gang violence isn't a 
public health issue. That's a that's another entirely different issue having to do with uh, with with crime and 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 drugs and and other things that that are are are, are prevalent in in urban environments. The public health portion of that again is very important because mental health issues and the suicide aspect of it. So, so just to talk real quick about the word or the, the phrase gun violence. A lot of people like to lump all gun deaths into the phrase gun violence, but the vet re reality is, is, is more than half of those uh, on, or, or more than half of those gun deaths each year are from suicide. Those suicides are a result of mental health. The guns are just a, an avenue that people use to carry out that act. So to, to lump that in with gun violence is, is um, it, it doesn't really work. It muddies the waters a little bit. It, it does, you know, it, it does make a, make for a good conversation. It makes for, makes, it, it helps certain people try to make a point, but, but we have to, we have to compare apples to apples. So the mental health issue we got to segregate this, the suicides from that because, you know, 45,000 people this each year in this country commit suicide, uh, say 25,000 of those use a, a firearm to commit suicide. The firearm was just the vehicle that, to make it happen. Could have been a rope, could have been a gun, could have been a building, could have been, a, or, or could have been a rope, could have been a, a, a jumping off a building, could have been a car, could have been anything. So to lump that in with gun violence. So yeah, the, the mental health aspect is a public health emergency in this country. There's no question about it. Um, also, people who commit mass shootings, the vast majority of people who commit mass shootings suffer from some kind of mental health. So again, that comes back to the public health crisis that we have in this, or the mental health crisis that we do have in this country. It's very important that those things get addressed. But the gun is just a, a symptom uh, or, or a byproduct in that conversation, the real root of the conversation when it comes to that needs to be the mental health aspect of it. Right. And I think a lot of the disagreement too comes down to who gets access to guns and what kind of guns do they get access to? Because obviously there's a spectrum from you know, a revolver to an AR-15 to a machine gun to, you know, a rocket propelled grenade. And obviously we draw a line somewhere in terms of what we allow uh, law abiding citizens in this country to access. I guess, Wilk, where would you draw that line when it comes to what kind of weapons Americans can legally purchase and own? Well, there, there are a lot of lines drawn when it comes to the kinds of weapons that people can buy. I mean, in, in the state in which I live, to buy a what would be considered a modern sporting rifle, like an AR-15 or something, uh, you have to have a, um, you have to have either a uh, concealed carry permit or you have to have, you have to be 21 years old, you have to have a concealed carry permit or you have to have a, um, I think it's, it's an enhanced background check and a, and a longer waiting period. Um, I think some of those things are, are a little bit, you know, overboard. Um, just, just, because, just because the statistics don't actually support things like that. Um, the statistics, when you look at the numbers from the Department of Justice statistics and the CDC and things like that, the number of, of people who are actually killed with um, uh, modern sporting rifles or long guns of any kind uh, in, in our country is very, very small, very minuscule compared to um, the number of, the, uh, of people that are killed with, with say, a handgun or, or things like that. The vast majority of violent crime that's committed with a firearm in this country is committed with a, um, with a handgun. Uh, so more people are killed in this country each year with blunt objects like hammers, rocks, boards, um, things like that, than they are with long guns. So, so the statistics don't actually support it. I know it gets a lot of 
Um, it gets a lot of attention because the while every death is tragic, the 24-hour news cycle and the the all the media attention goes quickly to uh, tragedies like happened in Buffalo, New York, or um, or uh, Uvalde, Texas. You know, Rob Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. Those things are are, are grotesque. They're they're absolutely horrible. They're horrific. Um, but the people that that got a hold of those guns, uh, again, you know, should have never had them. But the reality is, is that but, but particular, they did, but they did have them. <laughs> they did. They did. And, and, and yeah. in most in most cases, in most cases, those people get a hold of those guns in an illegal way anyway, or 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 some there was some failure in the system that led to them getting the guns. But there was probably a a statute on the books, a, a law on the books already that allowed them to get them. But the reality is the vast majority of people, you know, well over 99 percent of people in this country that own guns. Uh, I think it's 99.9 .9 something people that own guns that purchase them legally um, never commit a crime like that. So, so right. it's, 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 it's horrific it, when it happens. There's no it, question it, about it. It's horrific when it Mark, happens. without, without getting too in the weeds on the statistics, I want to just step back a little bit and ask you about the larger issue of how we balance um, obvious steps that we could take to reduce gun deaths with the second amendment because if you took the second amendment away it's pretty obvious that severely curtailing americans access to guns would lead to a meaningful reduction in gun deaths i mean when you look at other countries you know if somebody wants to kill as many people as possible those people exist in every country but if you live in a country where you only have access to knives, uh, you're probably going to be able to kill a lot less people. Take the issue of suicide. I, my understanding from research is that a lot of suicides are actually uh, not spontaneous, but people make the decision sort of in the moment. And so if they have a gun in the home, they're feeling suicidal, maybe they're under the influence put the gun to their head, pull the trigger, it's over, uh, versus maybe not having access to that immediate route to death, you might see some numbers go down. So given that we know, on the one hand, there's a, an, a meaningful interest in that. And then on the other hand, we do live in a country where we have a Second Amendment, where we have that strong history of self-reliance and individualism. How do you think about balancing those two things, Mark? Well, I think uh, I was um, thinking about what Wilk said about mental health. And uh, I think we need a broader notion of mental health uh, because urban violence is a public health crisis. Uh, that's a public health crisis. Uh, gun violence in cities, we think, oh, that's, that's just around gangs and uh, all the rest of it. I have walked streets where people who live there uh, fear for their lives. Uh, and it's not a mental health issue as much as it is uh, access to guns, usually access to illegal guns. Uh, suicide, as, as Wilk said, over half of suicides are um, committed uh, are committed by guns, which I consider to be gun violence. It's a very violent act. Uh, when people attempt suicide, uh, suicide by guns is, is most likely to be effective in terms of fatality than any other way. Where I live in New Hampshire, 80% of gun deaths are by suicide. In New Ham and Massachusetts, where I used to live, which has stricter gun laws, uh, the suicide rate is much, much less. So I think, you know, to look at that as a, as a broader uh, uh, picture that this really is a public health crisis. A story I like to tell after the Parkland shooting in 2018, I gathered a bunch of teenagers together and uh, one teen said, she was walking down the hall with her friend and they said jokingly to each other, okay, if somebody comes into the school 
do you drape yourself over me or do I drape myself over you? Now, in some ways they were, they were kidding with each other, but they were really serious because they were afraid. And I think we're all afraid. And I think we need to acknowledge the fact that everyone, regardless of where you, they sit on this whole continuum of debate, uh, people are afraid. And how do you deal with your fear? Uh, and it seems to me, and I'm interested to hear Wilkes' response, uh, the notion is that more guns make people safer. And I think that is a, is a way of responding to the fear. I tend to look at guns when they're um, fired at someone else is fear exchange machines that you take your fear and you literally shoot it into someone else and that will end the fear. Well, it doesn't end the fear. The fear metastasizes and that's what we're living with now in our culture is a culture of fear and how do we, how do we address the fear? And I could go off in all sorts of uh, scriptural citations about fear not, but the, the real fundamental issue, I think in many ways, is that we are all responding to fear and the fear is growing. And what's the best way to respond to fear? And I think um, uh, uh, reducing the number of guns and uh, which guns can be produced and who can own certain guns, I think is a way of reducing the fear and reducing the violence. Well, how would you respond to that? Well, I want to respond by actually bringing up something Mark said earlier, which, which I think he was right on track, is the, the conversation aspect of it. Because fear is generally based in ignorance. And, and in, most, in, in most cases, uh, all bad things uh, come, you know, ignorance causes fear, fear causes hate, hate causes anger, and anger causes violence. Okay. Part of what Mark said earlier was so incredibly important when he said, people like him and me need to have these conversations. One of the reasons that I'm a part of Braver Angels is so that people with differing opinions can have these depolarizing conversations because the conversations themselves actually help to eliminate the ignorance, which in turn decreases the fear. Um, you know, my gun or, or my house is full of guns. I'm not gonna lie, I, I, we've got plenty, okay? With that being said, I am not in any fear whatsoever of any one of my guns ever doing anything to me. It won't happen. The reality is, is education more than anything will do, education and conversations will do more than anything to eliminate the fear that we find in, in young people like Mark's story when he was walking down the hallway with those two young ladies. Uh, that education is the important part because when the media, you know, when the media talks about uh, things in the, in the way that they do, or when politicians talk about things in the way that they do, you know, I love Mark. I got a ton of respect for Mark because Mark has an open mind to listening to things. And he doesn't speak in hyperbolic terms of, about, you know, uh, stripping everybody of their gun rights and everything else. Um, the media and politicians, not so much. They, they like to, to take things to the next level. They try to do things that will instill fear and promote ignorance when it comes to things like firearms, firearm ownership, firearm statistics, things like that. If more people actually understood the fact that, and, and even, you know, even in, in Barack Obama's administration in 2013, when he had the Bureau of Justice Statistics and the CDC, go in and go out and collect information on actual defensive gun uses and, the, and what kinds of guns are being used in, in, in certain circumstances. They found that most, most of these gun regulations and most of the stories that, that, that were being promoted throughout the media and things like that, they just weren't portraying things with, 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 with truth. They just weren't. Like I said before, the, the, when it comes to trying to talk about a specific type of gun being more uh more a, a problem one type of gun being more of a problem than the other just because it looks scarier or, or um you know 
a semi-automatic semi-automatic uh, semi-automatic rifles have been around in this country literally since the early 1900s. I, I mean, the the uh, uh, so to so to to try and blame it on an AR-15, a modern sporting rifle that uh, that is is just a scarier looking or a military military appearing uh, rifle is not accurate because because the reality is is they're used in so few crimes but they are actually used in a lot of defensive gun uses the same study that was done in 2013 by the barack obama administration found that far more firearms were used for defensive gun uses each year than were used in uh you know violent crimes uh, uh, against uh, you know against people so so the reality is is it's more about education and conversations uh, you know, like Mark has been talking about, I, I think I think the real answer address address the mental health crisis that we have in this country. Um, you know, there's not a single there's not a single responsible gun owner in this country that does not agree with gun safety principles. You know, make sure that the gun is unloaded. Always treat the gun as if it's loaded. Never aim a firearm at anything you don't wish to kill or destroy. Never allow a gun in the hands of people, just like Mark's story earlier, where he had a friend that would not hunt with another gentleman anymore because he wouldn't unload the firearm when crossing a fence. That's a perfect principle. And, and that's really what it comes down to is, you know, that's two people that had a major disagreement, two people with loaded firearms that had a major disagreement that were not that we're not going to uh, uh, continue doing a, an activity together. But they didn't shoot each other over it. They just disagreed and, and parted ways. Or, or maybe the one guy learned his lesson and started unloading the firearm before he started causing offense. That would have been the best result. But the reality is, is we address this situation by addressing the mental health crisis, making sure that um, gun safety is is pre predominant in the minds and, and and all all gun activity. And, uh, and then making sure that the real truth comes out instead of people listening to, you know, the media and the, uh, the hyperbolic terms used by politicians. Well, when you say, I, well, I just to, yeah, Mark, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. I just want to follow okay. up on one, one point you made just to make sure I understand it. Well, were you saying that episodes of guns being used in a defensive manner outnumber episodes of guns being used against other people what do you mean by that exactly it means that guns are used every year in this country in more defensive gun use situations being if uh during violent crimes see most of the other countries this is another this is another thing that that people discount is when we talk about other countries and, and the fact that other countries have less so-called gun violence than the united states what they discount is the fact that those other countries, most of which have higher rates of violent crime than the United States does. So when violent crime or, or, or um, violent interactions between human beings in this country, maybe eight, 10% of them violent interactions actually involve a firearm. Well, the overall violent crime in this country and and firearm violence in this country has been de-escalating since you know at a, at a pretty rapid pace since the early 90s that's that's a fact uh it's much more predominant in the news and the 24-hour news cycle makes it seem like it's more it's actually less but the violent crime in this country has been going down whereas in other countries say uh great britain all over europe Australia, things like that, violent crime has actually been on an increase. People are not able to defend themselves and more people actually use firearms in a defensive manner in this country each year than people who are, are you know, are, are actually assaulted with a firearm. So let's say you're, you're um, uh, you know, your average mother of three is coming home from the grocery store and she parks her car in her driveway and she's going to take her groceries out of her car and somebody comes walking up behind her in her driveway and she pulls a gun out, out, of, out of whether it be her waistband or her purse and that perpetrator that was just about to attack her sees that that person is gone they're out they, they're not going to uh they're not going to continue that pursuit or that that violent attack on her 
um, things like that. The, the, that's a very common occurrence. And they say that- Well, well know, I don't know how common occurrence it is. I mean, I, I appreciate uh, that, that, that narrative, but I don't think it's that common. And uh, I think that's what's often said. I, um, I'm gonna go back to uh, a video that, that I was uh, viewed recently. I've been working with the New, New Hampshire Firearm Safety Coalition, which is working with um, gun safety instructors, gun shop owners and public health people to reduce the level of, uh, of suicide by guns. And the gun instructor in this two minute video said in your self-defense plan, and he, he cited uh, and showed all these guns, you can have these mechanisms uh, that, uh, that only you can uh, unlock your gun. Because people will say, um, to store my guns, if I'm gonna have a, uh, um, exercise self-defense in my home, if I store my gun, somebody comes in the house and it takes me two minutes to get to the cabin, unlock it, all the rest of it, uh, I'm, I'm in serious jeopardy. But there are now um, locks that you can uh, unlock and keep your gun by your bed and, uh, and access your gun in, in just a couple of seconds, which is, I think, important. That said, uh, and this is not a mental health issue, the data shows uh, that four and a half million kids in America live in homes where guns are not secured. And as we know, I, I don't know what the number is, but it's way, way too many of kids who shoot other kids. Uh, I was invited to go to St. Louis recently because two kids, uh, two cousins were in the bathroom playing with a gun, making a video, it went off and they both got shot and killed. And, and that stuff happens, that's anecdotal, but uh, the guns are not secure. To the mental health issue, uh, with the um, high rate of suicide by guns, the people who are committing suicide most often have an impulse. They're not mentally ill. They maybe have a flash of despair. And some say it's the 10 minute rule, that if you can talk them out of 10 minutes, uh, they're not going to think about committing suicide again. Uh, so they're not mentally ill people, but they're also in danger of themselves. Hence the, uh, the red flag laws or uh, emergency re reduced protection orders. I think those are important and that, that enhances public safety. What do you think about that, Wilk? Oh, I think, uh, like I said, I, I don't know a single responsible gun owner anywhere who, who doesn't agree that there's, there are definitely people out there that don't belong uh, owning firearms. That, that's, that, that's without question. I mean, it's not, uh, uh, it, it's not a situation of we just think everybody has the right to own a firearm no matter what their their mental state is. I've known a number of people who've committed suicide uh, and, and only one of them used a firearm. That may or may not be relevant in this conversation, but it's the truth. Um, uh, and unfortunately, the person that I do know that committed suicide with a firearm actually had a plan for several days, purchased the firearm, went through the background check, waited through the waiting period, got the firearm and killed himself less than 24 hours later. With that being said, still had nothing to do with the firearm. Was he mentally ill? He was definitely in a mentally bad spot. And, and we have to do a better job of recognizing that when it comes to a, a lot of situations. Okay. Not everybody that commits suicide, I will agree with Mark 100%. Not everybody that commits suicide is mentally ill. Not every situation that takes place in our lives and with people around us every single day is preventable as much as we would like it to be. Um, you know, we, we can look back to uh, several things in history that have played a part in the increased mental health crisis that we face in this country today, uh, whether it be the lack of civil commitment laws that we uh, we have the, the fact that uh, our government now has, has chosen not to, to protect people that are a danger to themselves, that, is, that has led to 
drastic increases in in homelessness and and violent crimes uh, of or, or drugs that have led to more violent crimes in in certain areas of the country all of those things are are just part of a bigger issue again that goes to mental health not guns uh, themselves um Red flag laws. Well, the first thing that I think of when I think of red flag laws is the fact that our government has a strong habit of abusing powers that they are granted by the people. So when our government takes a, a red flag law and then wants to take guns away from people without due process uh, because of whether it be an anonymous tip from somebody uh, or, or whatever. Now, is there merit to red flag laws? Yes, I, I believe that there are in certain circumstances. But I do believe that our government, with the habit that they have of using things like that to abuse uh, people for whether it be political power uh, or, or just for whatever, any, any number of reasons, they have a, they have a much longer track record of, it, record of abusing those types of things than actually using them effectively. So, but we, we, as, a community, we as communities, with, as individual communities, have to decide, um, you know, what we're willing to put up with, and uh, that's what the that's what the republic is about. So, if uh, if if you know, inner city, so you know, wherever decides that they want to have a red flag law like that, and it can pass constitutional muster, and uh, and and they want to do that, then people are welcome to move out of that area and, and go someplace else that supports freedom. I would agree with uh, Wilk uh, on unnecessary intrusion of removing guns. Uh, that's not the intent of uh, um, red flag laws. Um, I will concede that may that that may happen in certain situations, but the intent is somebody in the family sees someone else in the family who is feeling vulnerable, depressed. Uh, maybe uh, impulsive, and they want the firearm to be removed. That's the intent of it. How it gets implemented is another question. Uh, I, I, another issue that I think is important in this whole conversation is the tone that we use. And in another conversation that Wilk convenes a couple of months ago with a couple other, with another Braver Angels member, uh, we were talking about um, gun safety and restriction of guns. And uh, this person said, uh, what the, the way that he received it and so many gun rights people receive uh, these uh, positions is it's a shaming uh, uh, kind of presentation that they feel shamed and they double down. And he said, I double down in my desire to uh, um, fight any restriction of guns. And I think he's absolutely right that folks, uh, people on the gun violence prevention side, uh, which is, I agree with Will is uh, perhaps not the best use of terms, but people who want to um, uh, restrict the use of guns uh, come at it with a level of arrogance, self-righteousness, and shaming, which mitigates or prevents uh, uh, conversations that might get somewhere. And uh, the only place that I know of in the gun arena is around the area of suicide. That across the country now, there are more and more groups that are modeling themselves after the New Hampshire Firearm Safety Coalition, which was the first, as far as I know, to uh, bring people from uh, different sides of the gun issue together to reduce safe, uh, to reduce su suicide. Uh, that that is a place that um, conversation can start and it's possible to move the needle. Yes, I think that's encouraging. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the Senate seems poised to actually take some action on guns, which was frankly surprising to me, given the divide in government. Wilk, are you at all encouraged that some Republicans and Democrats among our leaders have been able to find some common ground? 
I I like the fact that they've been able to find some common ground on certain things. Um, I do get quite discouraged when these bills are are loaded down with other um, other things that that are are unrelated in an effort to to pass them. Um, like I said, there there's certain things when it comes to these bills. Like I said, some people are are more um, more willing to uh, go with with things that that may not involve full full due process than others but uh but yeah i mean if if we can if we can come up with uh uh a bipartisan and and bipartisan really doesn't mean anything to me but a a, a strong bill that does help to keep uh firearms out of men out of the hands of mentally ill people i know there's a lot of things in that upcoming bill that in, in uh include uh, funding for mental health programs and things like that. I mean, that's something that everybody should be able to get behind because mental health is is the root cause of of so many more things, uh, more than just a a firearm violence, uh, uh, you know, problem. So things like that are, are very important. The things that that I I like I said, I'll, I'll go back to the the, the due process thing. Um, you know, there's there's people out there on both sides of the aisle. That are more than willing to ignore due process, uh, so that uh, that bipartisan thing does get me a little little sketchy. Um, but uh, but but yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't think any anybody on the on a responsible gun owner side is is going to say that they don't want to find ways to keep guns out of the hands of people that uh, are going to use them to do harm to other people. It's just a matter of um, how that happens. Mark, and I would say, that... um, with respect to the Senate bill, and I think this is a, uh, an interesting kind of um, uh, uh, what recognition. What I'm hearing from from Wilk is it, the Senate bill may go too far. I don't think it goes far enough, and I'm grateful that we got something. And uh, we're going to continue to disagree, and I'm going to work as hard as I can to add to that restriction level. But having said that, want to continue to be in conversation with Wilk and others to see if there are ways that we can understand each other. And it's about guns, yes, but it's also about our rights. It's about um, our fear and it's about our hope. And when we can talk about rights, fear and hope in a way that we're sharing uh, our stories, sharing our histories, our experiences, and our concerns, I think that enables us to find common ground and move the conversation in a different direction. Hmm. Well, I think that's a good note to end the conversation. I think and hope that our listeners across the ideological spectrum We'll find a lot of food for thought in this episode, and I would encourage folks to write in to media at braverangels.org to let us know your opinion. Uh, let us know if you have any questions for Wilk and Mark. I can certainly pass them on, and if you like this conversation and, and want to hear more, I encourage you to like, subscribe, and share the podcast. Mark and Wilk, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Kieran. And thank, thank you, you Will. Yeah, Good thank you, Mark. You we'll, uh, we'll be talking again real soon. I appreciate okay. the opportunity, Kieran. Thank you very much. Thank you. Blessings.